topic from t uh, for tonight, you all know, it's continuing challenges, uh, democracy, and development in the Western Hemisphere. It's our enormous pleasure to have with us again uh, the Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, who was here once before addressing the Council when he was uh, uh, Deputy, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary. It's especially appropriate uh, for the simple reason that President Bush has decided to focus upon Western Hemisphere affairs. His uh, first meeting will be with the uh, head of state of Mexico. Uh, he's expressed the importance of the Western Hemisphere within the larger scheme of things in world affairs. Uh, and so the program turns out to be, I think, especially timing, timely. Uh, very quickly. Mr. Romero has been a member of the Foreign Service for 23 years. He served with great distinction, especially in the countries of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, he's been our ambassador to Ecuador. As I said, he was previ previously our principal deputy assistant secretary. And uh, the honors which he's received within the State Department are long and, and very impressive. Uh, it's my enormous pleasure to present to you Assistant Secretary of State, Mr. Peter Romero. Thank you, Frank, for those uh, very warm remarks and uh, that very nice introduction. Uh, my mother used to always tell me that uh, it wasn't so important that they invited you, but the real key is whether they invite you back. <laughs> so I am indeed happy to be here uh, and to uh, be invited back uh, with my new title as Assistant Secretary, not so new now, a couple of years. But I was delighted to be here the first time, and I thought that uh, you were an excellent group and uh, pretty well informed. And uh, uh, what I'd like to do is I've got a perfectly good speech here that my folks have written me uh, that I can make copies for you uh, because I'm not going to use it. What <laughs> What I'd like to do uh, is to uh, just speak from the heart and uh, to talk a little bit about uh, where we've come from with respect to our uh, relationship with the countries in the hemisphere and uh, where I see us going. And I'd be absolutely delighted to answer uh, any questions that you might have on particular countries, Haiti, Cuba, Colombia. Uh, there are a lot of things, Mexico, Canada, the uh, presidential trip to uh, Mexico, et cetera. Uh, but before that, let me congratulate you. I know you're all uh, still feeling the afterglow of a tremendous victory. I am a New Yorker. <laughs> but it did not stop me from, from uh, rooting for the uh, Ravens on Sunday. Uh, it did stop my father-in-law, who is an 84-year-old Washingtonian, who could not bring himself to root for Baltimore no matter what, and talk to me about Johnny Unitas until I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, I think that uh, uh, it's an excellent topic uh, and, a, and one that is exceedingly timely. Uh, certainly the Western Hemisphere and the issues that are engendered in the Western Hemisphere provide me as the Assistant Secretary and my Bureau more of an insight into America than probably any other Bureau uh, or any other office in the State Department. And the simple fact of the matter is that our hemisphere is, is, is integrating and growing so close at such an astonishing speed that we bureaucrats in Washington almost have to just keep up with the breathless pace of it all. Uh, just to give you an example, NAFTA. Uh, we are experiencing uh, two-way trade with Canada at the tune of about $1.3 billion a day. Uh, last year, uh, uh, the year 2000, uh, we will hit probably about $248 billion in trade with, uh, with Mexico. Uh, they are two of our leading energy partners, along with Venezuela. Uh, certainly, when you look around the hemisphere and uh, the travel, and if, you've, if you subscribe to magazines like uh, uh, even Forbes or, uh, or Travel and Leisure, you get a very clear sense that the hemisphere, for Americans, is becoming a much more prominent place. Uh, and we as Americans are beginning to feel truly as we are uh, part of a larger group of Americans that have gone through this same 
kind of harmonizing uh, experience that we all went through. Uh, just to throw out another statistic, by the year 2008, according to uh, the American Passenger, Air Passenger Association, um, there will be more traffic, air traffic, passenger traffic, north and south, uh, south and north, than east-west to Europe and return and Asia and return combined. Uh, so that gives you a little sense of where this hemisphere is going. And to talk a little bit about what I referred to in terms of, I, I almost feel like I'm the Assistant Secretary for the Americas, including the United States of America, uh, because the issues that I deal with are issues that come right home to Main Street. Uh, there is absolutely no debating the fact that foreign investment, trade in the hemisphere, the movement of labor, immigrants, legal, illegal, uh, counter-narcotics and law enforcement, uh, all of those things have a direct impact on Main Street USA. And I have to tell you that I don't envy my colleagues sometimes, those who are assistant secretaries for the Far East or South Asia or whatever, when they have to try to explain to an audience like this the critical importance of East Timor or Kosovo. They are very important things, and we are a global player. But there is no greater work, I think, that we do than when we bring and when we explain to the American public what it is we are trying to do with respect to advancing the US agenda and providing global leadership around the world. And that having been said, basically our goals remain the same. And that is to uh, strengthen democratic institutions in the hemisphere across the board, whether it goes, for, it, it goes from law enforcement all the way to judiciaries and electoral process, processes and good governance and anti-corruption and all of those things, uh, to uh, providing for economic stability by market openings and reforms, that, that kind of far off view of what we call third generation of structural reforms in many of these economies. Uh, these two things are linked, and that is economic well-being is critically linked with good governance and, and political reform in countries. Uh, it also, by the way, happens to give us tremendous value uh, for what we do in that it provides uh, ready markets and emerging markets uh, for our exports, and exports that have grown over 300% within the last seven years, by the way. Uh, I can't tell you how our embassies are literally besieged with Americans overseas, some of whom just happen to be uh, on vacation, who just see Ecuador and Bolivia and uh, Venezuela and Chile and Argentina and Mexico and Costa Rica and places like that as just great opportunities to do business. And you'd be surprised. We are there to serve you. And uh, critically, that is our most fundamental role, and that is to serve the American public overseas. And while I'm here to talk to you about the challenges that we face overseas and, and the way ahead and perhaps how we would approach this, we are there fundamentally to serve the American public overseas. And that, and that is uh, uh, a um, responsibility that we take very, very, very seriously. And before I get into a little bit more of a discussion, of uh, the two major goals, and the third one obviously being confronting real transnational uh, threats to the world. I'd like to talk to you for one moment about uh, funding for foreign affairs. Uh, when we did a poll in the American, within, I guess it was the American public writ large, we've done a couple of them. The latest poll showed that the American public believed, without knowing what, what the true numbers were, that about 17% of our federal, federal expenditures, or our, our federal budget, should be spent for foreign affairs. And that means uh, not only assistance programs, but operating our foreign affairs machinery, et cetera. Uh, that 17% would be just about right. And when told what the facts are, they're astonished. And the fact is that one cent out of every federal dollar goes for operating uh, all of our foreign affairs uh, agencies and our foreign assistants overseas and all the embassies and consulates overseas. Uh, we can't continue to operate this way. Uh, Secretary Powell in his confirmation hearing spent a lot of time 
on talking about diplomatic readiness. We as a people, when we think about national security, we think about the armed forces and military readiness, as we should. Some of us even think about uh, being able uh, to have uh, the right types of information and to have intelligence readiness, if you will, as we should. But very few of us think about diplomatic readiness. And yet, when diplomatic readiness is not there, and when diplomacy breaks down or fails, it's when you have no alternative but to use force. And that means risk putting American lives at risk. And we need to do a better job uh, with, uh, with the resources. Uh, Secretary Albright, ex-Secretary Albright, I thought did a commendable job. Secretary Powell is committed to getting more resources for, uh, for our domestic and overseas operations. So with that, uh, I'll step off the soapbox for a moment and talk a little bit uh, about Latin America. Certainly, I've given you the goals, and uh, those haven't changed over the years. But I think probably more than anything else, what has changed is the way we go about doing business in this hemisphere. And I think the fundamental blueprint that unites us all together is what we call the Summit of the Americas process. We've had two summits, one in Miami, uh, the other one in Santiago, Chile, about two years ago. And we will be uh, going to our third Summit of the Americas in Quebec, the end of April. Uh, this will be uh, President Bush's uh, first major uh, foreign uh, foray into uh, the world of multilateral diplomacy. And what we're hoping to do is to do uh, a number of things. First of all, when you look at the Summit of the Americas process, it is much, much more than we do anywhere around the world. Certainly, we have good observer status and dialogue with the EU community. And certainly, we are major players in APEC, the Asian Pacific uh, group. But uh, those are largely trade groupings. In the Summit of the Americas process, we have 10 working groups, all of them busily working in Miami. Please don't tell the the anti-globalist uh, demonstrators out there that we are working in Miami. We might find them dressed as trees tomorrow out in front. Uh, but uh, busily working towards the goal of a free trade area of the Americas by the year 2005. And what the goal is, is to reach agreement by the year 2005 or before to make it as easy to trade between the United States and Chile, for example, as it is to trade between Maryland and Georgia now. And I believe that the goal is well in sight. Uh, we will be circulating within the next couple of weeks a bracketed draft. And for those of you who are not familiar with our parlance, what that means is kind of an outline draft to start negotiations with. Uh, and there is growing sentiment that we shouldn't have to wait until the year 2005 to do this. If the rest of the uh, countries or the majority of countries are, uh, are ready, uh, some more than others. Brazil is holding back a little bit more. Uh, but that there are direct benefits for the United States and the United States worker uh, in a free trade agreement. This is certainly a, an administration which is committed uh, to free trade. If any of you caught uh, 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 the uh, ambassador designate for the uh, US as the US trade representative today, Robert Zellick, in his testimony that was carried on C-SPAN, I think you got a very clear sense that this hemisphere and this free trade agenda is very high on the radar screen. But there's a couple of things that are coming up that are very, very exciting. First of all, we had a meeting today. Uh, we celebrated a meeting between uh, uh, Secretary uh, Powell and uh, his uh, foreign minister counterpart from Mexico, Jorge Castaneda educated in the United States, taught at Columbia University. Uh, we, this is to set the basis for and to do the preparations uh, for the visit of uh, President Bush to uh, Mexico on the 16th of February. Uh, in addition to that, we've had meetings with, uh, two days after uh, the inauguration, we had a meeting with uh, the Foreign Minister of Canada. Uh, and his meeting was uh, to pretty much presage the meeting between President uh, Bush and uh, Prime Minister Chrétien on the 6th. Uh, we have free trade negotiations, bilateral free trade negotiations going on now with Chile. 
uh, and uh, we hope to conclude them before the summit. And then, of course, the summit, uh, President Pastrana of Colombia will be up here. So to be honest with you, I couldn't be more delighted that, w that this administration is off to a terrific start in terms of focusing on this hemisphere. Uh, I think that, uh, quite frankly, when uh, you look at the benefits derived, uh, 45 per, uh, cents out of every dollar spent for exports in this hemisphere are spent on U.S. exports. And that's without lifting a finger. That's without free trade. Can you imagine how we will benefit as a nation with free trade agreements uh, with, uh, with, with the, the, the countries or with an FTA, a free trade area of the Americas, uh, writ large? So the bidding looks very, very good. Uh, we have approached our work much more multilaterally than we used to do before. Certainly the United States has enormous influence in the hemisphere, still does. But rather than putting pressure on governments unilaterally to do the right thing, or uh, through a system of carrots and sticks with assistance and pressure and, and that sort of thing, we've decided, and we did this a number of years ago, about five years ago, to work through multilateral institutions. The Summit of the Americas process has good governance, uh, uh, civil liberties, human rights, uh, counter-narcotics uh, issues, good governance in terms of anti-corruption measures. All of those things you will find in the Summit of the Americas, and you won't find them in other kinds of regional group, trade groupings. But they're there because there is a recognition in this hemisphere that probably doesn't exist much uh, elsewhere, that what happens in one country directly affects the situation and the conditions in its neighbors. Um, with respect to uh, the summit writ, writ large, we will be discussing in Quebec something called a democracy clause. And that is uh, essentially that in order to belong to this exclusive club of uh, summiteers in the hemisphere, you have to be a democracy in good standing. And we're not going to tell you basically how to run your country, but we're going to hold you to your own constitution and your own laws. Uh, and we're going to say when those, when those laws are violated or broken, whether it be, be by civilians or by the military, then you're not going to be a member anymore. And you're not going to enjoy the benefits that flow from membership, such as access to our markets and other people's markets in terms of uh, free trade. There's a number of other exciting things uh, that are uh, on tap in the next couple of uh, months. But suffice it to say that I think we're off to an excellent start, uh, one that uh, really, uh, I think, uh, picked up from uh, uh, a very good focus and attention that the uh, Clinton administration gave to my region of the world. Certainly, if you look over the last couple of years, uh, natural disasters as a result of uh, weather phenomenon that we still really haven't gotten a, a, a great grip on yet uh, have affected uh, Central America and the Caribbean probably worse than any other part of the world, and certainly worse, worse than, than ever in their own history. Uh, Hurricane George, Hurricane Mitch, uh, the Clinton administration, and I was proud to be a part of that, uh, was responsible for uh, a relief package of about $600 million uh, for that region of the world, and hopefully we've built some greater capacity uh, in doing that. We turned over the Panama Canal without a hitch. You guys don't hear about uh, ships getting stuck in the canal or, or, or getting uh, blocked on one side or the other and not being able to make the crossing, uh, largely because the Panamanians are doing a fine job. Thank you. Uh, in fact, they're plowing in about uh, two and a half billion dollars more to widen uh, the Gayard Cut and some other places in order to accommodate more traffic and things are going well. Uh, we pulled out of our bases there, and, uh, and the alternative, uh, because now we, well, we lost access to Howard Air Force Base for our counter-narcotics flights, um, we have established what's known as forward operating locations where our crews can rest overnight and, uh, and uh, pick up and fly in the morning on uh, counter-narcotics monitoring and detection uh, in places like Aruba, Curaçao, El Salvador, and Monte Ecuador. These are things that probably could not have been done just a few years ago because of the lack of confidence that perhaps this was kind of a land-based aircraft carrier that we were going to use to invade their country. This is no longer the case. There is a great deal of confidence uh, in our motives. Uh, we work multilaterally, as I mentioned, uh, strengthening the OAS, strengthening the OAS process, and actually 
strengthening groupings that we don't even belong to. Mercosur, for example, is a grouping, uh, mostly trade, uh, but does have the so-called democra democratic clause to it uh, that includes uh, as full members Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, and when Paraguay started to teeter and looked like uh, it was going to fall off the dem democracy map, uh, we weighed in along with all of uh, Paraguay's Mercosur partners to ensure that they remain democratic. Uh, the same thing with the OAS in Peru. Uh, there was a, an excellent session in Windsor, uh, Ontario of the OAS General Assembly last, uh, last spring. And in, on, in unambiguous terms, uh, the OAS spoke with great unanimity saying that we didn't like what we saw in Peru. We thought the elections were flawed. Uh, we thought that there was a tilting of the playing field in the favor of uh, Fujimori and his, and his political party. Uh, and that uh, while we couldn't undo the elections because in the final round his opponent decided to back out of them and he ran virtually unopposed, we were going to insist upon some very intrusive democratic principles. Those democratic principles provided a catalyst for the opposition uh, to coalesce around. Uh, and I think uh, in the final analysis when uh, Fujimori was uh, forced uh, from office, it provided uh, these opposition groups with an opportunity to have worked together, to dialogue, to have dialogued, and to establish a plan of government for uh, a group of people, mo the most of whom had never ever been inside government, and some of whom had been in government but 12 years before. Uh, and uh, they will hold elections in April, and uh, there will be a turnover of a new elected uh, Peruvian government in July, a success story for the OAS, for the hemisphere, and for us. Uh, essentially, throughout the hemisphere, you see the United States uh, supporting what we, we've come to call the first tier of defense for democracy. And those countries that are more advanced on the democratic side, uh, countries like Argentina and Brazil and Chile, and even now, uh, even more so with Mexico, truly democratic and playing a much more vigorous role, uh, we hope that, uh, that they can go out there. And so when there are situations that become hot, it doesn't mean that we fall into the trap of putting pressure for uh, strengthening of democracy or for political stability, and it becomes a Peruvian U.S. argument or a sovereignty argument. Because when you've got the whole neighborhood up in arms because of something uh, happening in a particular country, it strengthens your argument and it strengthens the process. And that really is what uh, it's all about in terms of the summit process and in terms of uh, the General Assembly. Um, Notwithstanding the rosy picture that I just painted you, there are some trouble spots that continue. One is Cuba. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, um, as the uh, Secretary has, has said, that uh, probably biology will have more to do with resolving what happens in Cuba than just about anything else. There is certainly no indication that uh, uh, Fidel Castro is inclined towards um, uh, a democratic opening in any way or uh, a softening of his relationship uh, with us. Certainly we have worked with, we've, we've agreed to disagree with countries like Mexico and Canada in the past uh, to see them have an engagement policy uh, where for their efforts they've been kicked in the teeth by Fidel Castro. Um, I think that, uh, that our people to people measures that we put into place over the last two years uh, in the wake of the Pope's visit to Havana have paid off in big dividends and it certainly put the Cuban regime on the defensive, largely because it uh, breaks the um, hold on information that the Castro regime has. And uh, when you uh, are promoting exchanges, and last year we had, we knew of about 80,000 Americans that went to Cuba and they go with all kinds of different messages, including messages critical of our own government, which I find just fine. Because if you can get an American to go to, uh, to Cuba and criticize our government, that has a very powerful me message to a Cuban citizen who can't. 
there uh, have been another, uh, a, a number of other measures that we put in place. We've raised the cap on remittances to enable uh, Cubans who have family here that send these remittances back to be free of uh, the virtual slavery that the administration will keep them in with respect to job, jobs and job opportunities. Uh, and in many, many ways, through these exchanges and through the remittances and the charter flights and all of the other things that we've done, we've really begun to cut into uh, Fidel Castro's number one propaganda weapon, and that is that the enemy of the Cuban people is the American people. Uh, and essentially, he's in a situation where he can't control, as he used to, uh, the information that was going to, to his own people. Uh, certainly around the hemisphere, we've got problems in Colombia. Uh, we are preparing a package as we speak uh, for Colombia's neighbors to try to not only resolve what's going on in Colombia in a holistic, comprehensive way, but to try to keep it in Colombia by strengthening Colombia's neighbors. And it will not be simply a law enforcement package. We are going to be putting in a lot of um, um, effort into alternative development, infrastructure, uh, work creation, education, uh, uh, small business uh, loans, uh, small business uh, training, and that sort of thing to bring uh, the most susceptible at-risk groups uh, in, uh, in the countries neighboring Colombia back into the fabric of their own societies. So let me stop my, my prepared ramblings, uh, if you will, uh, and uh, I'd be prepared to answer any questions that, uh, that you might have. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the overview. The floor is open for questions. Yes, ma'am. We, we've spent a lot of money in Colombia. Can we be successful? I'm not sure I have a ready answer for you because I don't know whether we'll be successful. But I do know one thing, and that is that we would, be, we would have a disaster on our hands if we did nothing. Let me, let me explain. Over the last couple of years, we've been successful in uh, working with both the Peruvian and Bolivian governments, two other countries that, where coca is grown, to reduce coca cultivation in um, Peru 57%. That means that the hectareage under cultivation of coca was reduced by 57%. In Bolivia, we reduced it 66% in the course of three years. What happened was, through uh, a strategy of eradication, alternative development, uh, and law enforcement on the ground, and interdiction, air interdiction in the case of Bolivia, we were able to basically drive two-thirds of their market out of, uh, out of business in terms of cultivation. What happened? was that many of the people who were growing coca in this high-grade coca in these countries and refining it in laboratories along the border between uh, uh, Colombia and Ecuador and along that southern border, uh, just simply moved those fields closer to the laboratories where they refined it. They couldn't get it to market. It was too difficult. Peasants wouldn't grow it. And so they moved it to this area in southern Colombia called the Putumayo. Uh, what happened over the last couple of years was uh, a pretty scary proposition, and that is that coca cultivation in the southern Columbia area exploded. The problem is compounded by the fact that the government does not, nor has it ever had, much of a presence in this area. It's mostly jungle. There is no infrastructure. Transportation networks consist of rivers. Uh, and essentially, over the years, guerrillas and paramilitaries have gravitated to that region. When we did the numbers, about four years ago, we determined that these irregular forces of guerrillas and paramilitaries were making about $200 million a year from taxing coca cultivation and selling it to narco traffickers. When we saw the 300% increase and the trends going up, basically we stepped back and said, OK, if you do nothing and the Colombian government doesn't do anything and basically continues on the same glide path, that probably in about two years, these irregular forces will have access to about a billion dollars a year from coca uh, uh, cultivation. Uh, and when you look at the kinds of terrorism that they've wreaked inside Colombia 
and elsewhere, it became, uh, um, I think, a responsibility of the Colombian government and of ourselves and Colombia's neighbors to try to do something about it. Now, what do you do about it? Well, we know that eradication along with alternatives for development, alternative crops, and uh, a pretty good law enforcement uh, mechanism, and community-based benefits, by the way, worked. Uh, and they uh, continue to work in Peru and in Bolivia. The problem with Colombia is that there is no government presence in this area to do anything. Okay? So basically, we had, to, we had to go back five paces and say, OK, we'll be working with the Colombian government. But number one, the Colombian government needs to establish a presence on the ground, both civilian, military, and police. And once that happens, then you've got to provide alternatives to the people who are growing coca in that area. And not only do you have to provide alternatives by way of infrastructure projects and, and uh, small business loans and training and, and alternative crops and that sort of thing, but you've got to beef up that whole area around the coca growing area or else you're just going to substitute one group of, of coca cultivators or pickers uh, for another that will just come in from surrounding areas. Uh, and that's basically what we are doing. We are, we are, pro we're providing that, uh, that assistance by way of alternative pursuits. We're trying to work with the Colombian government to establish a presence on the ground down there. Uh, we are working with Colombia's neighbors to make sure that the flow doesn't spill over into these uh, other countries. We've got uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees working for those people who will be displaced by this, people who don't own land but who are day workers, if you will, on these coca plantations. Uh, and then we have uh, aerial spraying going on. Uh, the peasants on the ground are given six months, uh, for the ones who own small, relatively small holdings, six months to opt for the alternative development and their own manual eradication of coca, okay, uh, or they get sprayed. Uh, what we're doing right now is spraying large plantations over the course of three weeks the Colombian government with, with the uh, State Department air wing sprayed 25,000 hectares of, uh, of coca, 25,000 hectares, which is, if my math serves, probably about 55,000 hectares. Acres, I'm sorry, acres. Uh, and we're just beginning to make a dent. Now, with all of the other things and the government presence and the establishment of courthouses in these areas that have never existed before, it's going to be a very slow slog. But something has to be done. You praised Colombia, yet Colombia has not been certified as doing enough by, I believe, by the State Department. Colombia was not certified about four years ago, three years ago now, uh, when uh, there was a uh, president by the name of Ernesto Samper. And the reason why it was not certified uh, uh, was because we had evidence, not only us, but just about everybody in Colombia, that there was several million dollars that came, that went, that came from drug cartels that went into his political campaign. Um, now, that happens sometimes, OK, when you don't have the kind of safeguards in place uh, to prevent dirty money from going in a campaign, particularly in a place like Colombia. But instead of admitting it, instead of saying, OK, maybe it happened, we'll get to the bottom of it, I'll investigate, he was into denial mode the whole time. So that affected our ability to do business with him. But we kept things going with the police and with some of the other elements of the government that we felt were not corrupt. And it had a good effect. You saw on CNN and, and some of the other shows recently a replaying of the takedown of all of these big uh, narcos during that period of time, the big cartels. Etc. But what it what it what it did not do was to get into this area that we're talking about. There's 2,500 narcotics policemen in Colombia. 2,500. There's they're just simply not enough to deal with uh, the growing nexus between guerrilla forces, paramilitary forces, and narcos. Uh, and over the last three years, we have certified uh, that Colombia has fully cooperated with us. Uh, and we think that the cooperation is not only good, but getting better. The question is, what are we doing to cut the market for drugs? That's an excellent question. I have to tell you one thing, though. It really pains me when members of Congress, particularly, and, and members of the general public, say we shouldn't be spending 
X number of dollars overseas on the supply side, we need to spend it on the de demand side. It is not an either or or proposition. You've got to do both. You've got to do both. Because if you, even if you reduce demand, we have seen in countries like Colombia, uh, pardon me, countries like Mexico, and even in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, when, when the big narcos were taken down and the, and the smaller fish that, that came in to uh, uh, replace them um, started operating, they didn't, they didn't operate in the same way. The big narcos used to pay traffickers to get their product to the streets of New York and Baltimore and Washington and Philadelphia. Okay? What the small guys did, they didn't have a big bankroll. And so what they did was they paid the traffickers, the people who provide the, 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 uh, the vehicles, and then, of course, the, the networks that sell the stuff out on the streets. What they did was they provided them a cut of the cocaine itself. And so in many places, like Mexico and in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic particularly, those people who were responsible for transporting this coke and then being paid in coke had to create a market for, for, for coke in their own countries. And they did. And now you have a, 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 a growing problem of consumption in places that you never thought would have been a big problem, okay? Because basically they created a market where there, was, what, where there wasn't one. So the typical uh, laws of supply and demand don't always work. But I take your point, you've got to have uh, a, a much a much more robust program on the demand side in this country, and I hope that that over the next couple of years we, we get a good we get a we get a, um, uh, a good focus on it. We like to say, and I tell Latin audiences all the time when I'm giving this kind of presentation in Buenos Aires, for example, I'll say seven out of ten dollars that we spend on this issue are spent at home, and that's true. But when you look at at, at the vast majority of that seven out of ten dollars that we spend at home, a lot of it is for basically just constructing prisons and not for education and rehabilitation, et cetera. What's the uh, post-Castro prognosis? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, post-Castro prognosis. Um, I think that uh, in many ways, for we diplomats that deal with this issue, this is the proverbial third rail of our issues, uh, the Cuba policy. And I'm not real sure that, uh, that the, uh, the vote count in uh, Florida made it any easier, by the way. Uh, this is an issue that, that inspires a lot of neuralgia in, in not just Washington, but all over the country. And there are those who feel very strongly that if we were open the gates and say trade with Cuba tomorrow, that Castro would be a relic. I don't know whether that's true or not. I can tell you that where he has his policy of managed trade now, uh, where he basically will take an investor and say, Okay, you want to invest, you want to operate a hotel, for example. I will tell you how much to pay your workers, and I will tell you who to, who to hire, and you will pay me, and I will turn around and I will pay your workers. And if there are taxes to be paid, you'll pay me, etc. It's not exactly what you call free trade or any form of capitalism that we know. So there are those, and, and this is an honest, I think, debate, is that those there are those who believe that if you were to open the floodgates to, to investment, that he would manage it in such a way as to only enhance and strengthen his own regime. I don't know what, the, what, what, what would happen. Uh, there have been a, a million analyses done on Fidel Castro and whether he's sick or not sick, or he doesn't look well today, he's hunched over a little bit more, he repeated himself yesterday, I mean, you know, it goes on and on, and we spend lots of money analyzing this. The bottom line is he's in pretty good health. He'll probably be around for a while. Uh, I don't see any heir apparent. Uh, and uh, I think uh, those who say that his younger brother, Raul Castro, could, could, could fill his shoes, uh, I think are mistaken. I don't think anybody else on that island has the charisma. The question for me is not when he goes as much as we need to do more to ensure that, uh, that Cuba has a soft landing after he goes. And I'm not so sure we've done, we've, we've done the right thing on that. Would you comment on currency problems relative to the enhancement of trade? Well, cer certainly currency problems continue to plague the region. Uh, I think that, that each country has dealt with it in a different way. Uh, certainly um, the, uh, the Asian flu that floated over into our hemisphere and infected Brazil 
two years ago more than any other country shows you that uh, this world is, is, is tied together in a way that we've never been, been tied before. Um, but when you look at economic performance writ large, I think that uh, most countries uh, believe that, uh, that uh, IMF conditionality is a legitimate thing. They need to keep fresh lines of, of, uh, of uh, credit coming their way. Uh, and they've instituted currency uh, reform in most countries. And I think you're beginning to see an interesting phenomenon with dollarization. You had the Ecuadorians decide to dollarize. I think that, is, that has definitely helped uh, their economy. It's not a cure-all. There are still some significant structural reforms that need to be done in, in Ecuador, but it certainly has helped. Uh, uh, El Salvador has just done it. Panama was, was always under the dollar in Guatemala. Has, uh, is moving towards the same thing. De facto, you have uh, the, uh, a dollarized economy in Argentina. And in most of these countries, you can go down with US dollars and go to the 7-Eleven. Uh, so they're, they're, if they're not dollarized, their currencies are pegged to the dollar. Uh, and, I, and I think that overall, that has provided a great deal of, of monetary stability in the region. And I see probably more of it than less over the years. The question is, when you spray, uh, what do you use? And is the ground arable afterwards? Uh, there have been some of the most, some of the most uh, outlandish newspaper articles about Agent Orange and, and all kinds of other, uh, other kinds of things. In Colombia, which is the only country that we spray, in, in, in Bolivia and Peru, we do manual eradication with, with host country uh, officials there. Um, in uh, Colombia, we do spraying simply because there's just such a vast area there. Uh, and it's so remote that that's about the only way that you can get to it. And we use a very, very exotic herbicide called Roundup. <laughs> it is sprayed uh, from planes at uh, approximately um, 500 feet. Uh, they do one pass over, over an area. And uh, then they'll go up the other side of the mountain and down the other side and do another pass. Uh, they will look at aerial photography. They will determine where they have to go back, and they will do that. They will not hover and saturate an area. They're very careful to, to ensure that the right mixtures are, are sprayed from the planes and that there uh, uh, is no uh, uh, potential or possibility of having damage to uh, livestock, crops, or even people. Uh, there have been a lot of stories about children being in clinics with, with boils and things like that. Uh, but truly, we have not seen any kind of evidence. And we're, we've, we've, we've paid for a number of studies in these areas uh, and are prepared to pay for even more uh, that would demonstrate that this has been harmful to, uh, to animals, people, or, 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 or plants, other than the ones. About the ground. Can they grow on yes. The in fact, in many areas where we spray, if, if, uh, if there are rains, heavy rains, the day the following the spraying, basically you have to go back and do it because the rains will just wash it away. So there was a question first of, of whether um, the, uh, the planes, the spray planes were shot at, and they are. And we provide million dollar life insurance policies for these very courageous pilots who fly them. Uh, they'll even get to the point where they'll stretch rope across a field from, from high trees to try, or cables to try to down planes and that sort of thing. So it's a risky business. Um, in terms of uh, um, the question, the follow-on question was President Chavez of Venezuela uh, and uh, what path, democratic or not, is he headed on? And I think uh, the answer to that is um, I don't know, and nor do the Venezuelan people. Uh, certainly, he is a person that has come from a very humble background, uh, who very much sympathizes with the poor and downtrodden. There is absolutely no debate that Venezuela was due for um, a reform across the board, social, political, economic. Uh, and he, he came to power with about 70%, 72% of the vote, promising to do just that. And I, I don't take issue so much in his reform of the judiciary. We don't take issue in that. I think that was long overdue. The system was very, very corrupt. Nor in the, very, the many plebiscites and the creation of a unicameral legislature. 
uh, and um, the reform of the police and, 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 and many other things. It really isn't the problem. The problem is that in the process of reforming it, basically what has happened is he has taken away, or in the process of taking away, practically all of the things that we as Americans hold dear, and that is checks and balances. All of these institutions are made in his image, packed by people who he can absolutely count on, and he does not brook uh, criticism particularly well. And that's the problem. Reform was long overdue, uh, but what's coming out of it is worrisome for the potential of, of, of becoming much more of a, on a, an authoritarian state. My question is the new administration's attitude toward Haiti. Well, Secretary uh, Powell is very familiar with Haiti. In fact, uh, he was in Haiti uh, the day before uh, the, uh, our troops from Fort Bragg invaded Haiti and was able to uh, get Haitian authorities to agree, uh, the Haitian military th the leaders at the time, to leave and to provide for a democratic opening. And what has happened in the last couple of years has been, uh, in many ways, disappointing. On the positive side, uh, we have had um, an end to people risking life and limb to uh, raft their way to the United States. That has pretty much ended. Uh, the blood that was flowing in the streets that characterized uh, the military regime in Haiti has pretty much ended. Uh, there is space for criticism uh, in the, uh, within the media and also uh, space for opposition political parties there. Uh, but there is a very worrisome ling and lingering culture of violence there where people are occasionally assassinated and intimidation uh, where opposition political parties uh, do not feel as comfortable as they should in terms of freedom of expression and organization, assembly, etc. There is a long way to go. We were not happy with the May 21st elections, which we, we believed was essentially an electoral coup, the way that, the, way the votes were counted. Uh, we have uh, made that known many, many times. Uh, and we will hold uh, president-elect uh, and uh, to be, I guess, inaugurated on the, on the 6th of February, uh, President Aristide, uh, accountable uh, to eight points that we've established to include fixing the May 21st elections, providing a genuine democratic opening, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, uh, uh, fight corruption, straighten out the police, do a better job on, on, on counter-narcotics measures, and a host of other things. Uh, this administration uh, has said that uh, they will accept the eight points that we have put on the line with uh, President, current President Preval and, and future President Aristide, but we reserve the right to put in more if the situation warrants, and I believe uh, we will. How big a problem is uh, President Chavez? <laughs> <laughs> well, he is a very active member of OPEC, uh, but his uh, energy minister is now the Secretary General of OPEC, and actually, uh, while I think you can, you can trace the roots of the latest uh, uh, energy crisis uh, to uh, OPEC and, and uh, several of the members, uh, Venezuela writ large has had a very responsible energy policy. Uh, does he do things to try to provoke us? He does. Uh, Fidel Castro spent uh, a wonderful week uh, and uh, played baseball and then with uh, Hugo Chavez, and uh, they were on TV together, and they talked about how nasty the United States was or is. Um, he went and, and has the distinction of being the first uh, leader uh, from a democratic country to visit Saddam Hussein uh, since the uh, Gulf War, uh, and does a lot of things to deliberately go out of his way to provoke us. Uh, I think the important thing is that we uh, not react to these provocations, uh, that we uh, look more at what he does, and generally it's been okay. We've got some concerns about what he's doing domestically, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but uh, we wish reform success in Venezuela, okay? But if it does not succeed, I think the key thing for the United States is not to be blamed, rightly or wrongly, for that failure. Would you comment on the job market in the United States and the balance of trade with our trading partners? relative to NAFTA, uh, keeping in the back of one's mind uh, congressional and labor union opposition earlier? 
Well, when you go back to previous elections, and uh, there was a candidate by the name of Ross Perot, independent candidate by the name of Ross Perot, who, who became famous for talking about that giant sucking sound. Okay. Well, if there is a giant sucking sound coming out of Mexico, it's basically for U.S. goods and services and not jobs. Um, we have added several million jobs since then. We continue to add jobs. Uh, every analysis that has been done with respect to free trade generally and NAFTA in particular um, has uh, indicated that, that there is net, significant net job growth for us. We have, uh, we have that, and that's irrefutable. Okay? But there is a phenomenon in the United States, and I don't exactly know how, how you can confront it, and that is I just read in the paper the other day that the economy is cooling off and several big companies are having to uh, lay off workers. And one, I think there was 36,000 was, was the highest, but uh, other companies, 5,000, 6,000, et cetera. Um, but I'm waiting to see those companies listed who have added 5,000 jobs and 10,000 jobs. Because if you just look, if you just read the newspaper, uh, there wouldn't be anybody working in the United States today. So at some point in between these recessions where we get grim, dismal statistics, there's got to be lots of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs that are added. And this gets to my point. And the point is that certainly it is good. NAFTA has been good for America. It's been good for our economy. And as Mexico continues to grow at a very healthy pace, 7.8% last year, they buy 70% of what they buy are our goods and services. Canada is the same way, okay? Uh, and the rest of the hemisphere to varying degrees pretty much the same way. This is good for jobs. But you never hear about um, people who got their jobs because of NAFTA. You only hear about the people who didn't get their jobs or, or the factory closed or whatever. Uh, and that's true. That stuff is true. But my belief and our belief in the government has been and continues to be, that we would probably lose those jobs anyway. The, the broom factory in Wisconsin, as terrible as it is when it closes and puts 200 people out of work in small Wisconsin town, and you hear about it at, uh, at, at night, would probably have had to close even if NAFTA didn't exist because we are importing brooms from elsewhere around the world and they can be made much cheaper. But that doesn't mean that we are not benefiting in other parts of our economy. And that's what, what economic growth is, is all about. Uh, so in the aggregate, the answer is there is absolutely no doubt about the fact that we have benefited. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, it has resulted in some dislocations. But there are benefits for those people, retraining benefits, et cetera, for those people whose, whose factory or plant closes and relocates in Canada or, or Mexico. And hundreds of thousands have taken advantage of it. Balance of trade, uh, positive with Canada, continues to be. Uh, with Mexico, it was very positive, and then they had the peso crisis, could not afford to buy uh, our manufactured uh, goods and our services. Uh, and we were importing huge amounts of oil from them. And so the balance of trade was out of whack. It's coming back, I would say, projections. Uh, within the next two years, uh, it will be uh, a surplus for the United States again. The uh, question is, what should the role of the United States be to prevent uh, disasters such as the recent oil spill? Uh, and more generally, uh, I suppose, uh, how we should deal with it? Um, I don't think there's anybody in our government that, that knows firsthand the true value of the Galapagos for humankind. And UNESCO has named it as a patrimony of humanity, largely because of, of, of its very unique value. When I was ambassador uh, to Ecuador, I went out to the Galapagos about a dozen times, and it is truly magnificent. Uh, when this happened, it brought into stark relief, I think, uh, the lack of um, adequate uh, procedures and, uh, and equipment that the, Ecuadorians, uh, 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 that the Ecuadorians really don't have in the area. Uh, the Galapagos has generally been a pretty sleepy place. When you, when you go there as a tourist, you, you mostly have to stay on boats. You, there are very few hotels. 
uh, that can accommodate you, and it's about as pristine as any place on the face of the earth. Luckily, what happened was when they had this huge spill, uh, we sent down uh, a plane load of equipment and a Coast Guard team to try to help them out uh, to contain the oil. And luckily, with the currents and the prevailing winds, this oil went out to sea, missed one of the other islands in the archipelago, and basically they, they were able to save themselves by sheer luck. But uh, they're going to have to do a whole lot more with respect to readiness for these kinds of disasters in, in, uh, in Ecuador. How much of an effect can the Buena Vista Social Club have <laughs> on Cuban-American relations? He didn't do justice to the question. He really did. We're going to have to educate him. We're waiting. <laughs> um, well, let me back up one step and say that, that I, am, I am very proud uh, to be a Hispanic American uh, in America today. Um, not only will we become the uh, largest minority in America in five short years, uh, but already there has been uh, just such uh, 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 a cultural renaissance uh, of the Americas in our own country. And uh, uh, there's probably no greater uh, uh, rebirth, if you will, or rediscovering uh, than Cuba and Cuba's culture and, and, and music and food and everything else. Uh, and the Buena Vista Social Club is this great group of old guys who played uh, what has, has come down or has evolved into modern day salsa music back in the 30s and 40s. And uh, 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 an American uh, uh, businessman slash artist by the name of Ry Cooter decided to pull them all together and made a, made a kind of an amateurish movie about, uh, on them. And it is absolutely superb if you haven't seen it. Go see it. Uh, I was in uh, Aspen, Colorado uh, about, uh, I guess it was uh, April of last year, and they were playing in the Little Opera House out there. Uh, I was in, um, uh, gosh, it was somewhere in Minnesota, and they were there. Um, I, go to, I went to Louisville, Kentucky the other day, and there was a little Cuban restaurant that had opened up. Uh, I think it's just great, uh, and I hope that it continues. And it's exactly what we'd, what we'd hoped would happen with making access to Cuba and the exchanges more easily and more readily available to American citizens. And I hope that that, that opens up Cuba and provides the kinds of uh, uh, strengthening of relationships on a people-to-people -people basis that will, will hopefully uh, help with the soft landing. On Thank you very much. On that exuberant note. <laughs> We do thank you for covering so much ground. I don't think there was any major question which was left untouched. And I didn't see any hands eagerly suggesting that was the case. Uh, it's been a marvelous evening for us. We thank you for your time very much.